What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Undrunken Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney, and I want you to join me as I talk with real people and have super gritty conversations about their journeys to becoming undrunken. So let's go. Dump the drink because it's time to get this party started. Hello. Welcome to a new kind of happy hour. Today I'm talking with Beverly, who is actually the inspiration for my journey to undrunkenness. Beverly, welcome. All right. Well, first of all, thanks for providing this platform that allows me to share my story of my journey into my relationship with alcohol. Well, thank you for joining. (laughs) Yeah, and I I hope that, you know, my story can, uh, if it can be of help to someone else, then, you know, that's uh, a good thing. So I'm I'm glad to share it and hopes that can happen. Absolutely. The Undrunken series is kind of my way of journaling. Um, I suck at journaling. I've tried on and off for years and years. I was really inspired and share that you're the inspiration for this. Well, I thought I'd start my journey at the beginning as I was like thinking back, which is this has all been like, you know, an exploration of my relationship with alcohol. So it probably started, well, of course, you know, as soon as you're born, we're all um, exposed to stimulus that we take in my family in a, I grew up in a, a, a midwestern town um, not exactly a farming community but a farming community a Christian community my parents weren't big drinkers I never saw them drink very often as a matter of fact I don't think I but one time in my later life ever actually saw my father drunk Um, I would when we got together with family there was never alcohol involved when they got together with their friends and their children there wasn't alcohol so my exposure like probably a lot of us began in high school and you know I was exposed to the crowd that um, you know you wanted to drink to be in the cool crowd and I don't know if I ever really liked it at first, but it was more a part of, you know, let's be a part of the the crowd that I wanted to be in. So, and during that time, my my parents did have um, an alcohol cabinet and I would sneak into it. Mm -hmm. I remember my brother and I would sneak into it and then we'd replace some of it with water. I think other people have probably had done some of that. And my parents they were aware. And eventually there was a little lot that showed up on that liquor cabinet. So uh, (laughs) we were pulling the wool over everyone's eyes. So, Um, but more in high school, it was probably something, you know, to be with the in crowd. And my earliest impressions of alcohol growing up were, was that, um, not seeing my parents drink and I felt kind of like we weren't part of the the rich people people that were more well to do they drank at their social functions my parents maybe couldn't afford to or that that's what I maybe I thought was that and I can't they're not around so I can't ask them but you know they there wasn't alcohol involved and then those people that were alcoholics in the community were, you know, shamed by others. And I can remember somebody's father getting killed in a drunk driving accident and how shameful that, the shame it brought on that family or the alcohol use. So, so that was kind of my earliest exposures to alcohol. And then, of course, you go, when I went off to college, you're exposed even more to alcohol, and alcohol was a big use there. However, when you're young and in college, you really don't have a lot of money. So it was kind of hard to afford alcohol. So it was a special occasion when you'd save up your pennies to maybe have alcohol on the weekend. And then, of course, you kind of choose what's important to you. Where I grew up, 
weed was readily available. They called it homegrown back then. And <clears throat> you could get lots of weed and um, smoke lots of it. And that was kind of the, the drug of choice for me in my 20s, just because of cost um, for, you know, a, a way to kind of zone out. We would uh, smoke a lot of weed, but there wasn't a lot of alcohol use. So then um, after college, my first husband became a lawyer. And in that culture, alcohol is kind of widely used in, in the legal community as a, and a lot of communities as a social gathering where you gathered after work and it was like to go to bars and drink alcohol. And so it became a bigger part of my life. And by the time I was in my mid thirties and you no, know, we were financially set and it was easy to be able to afford fine wines. And during that time, it wasn't, uh, my drinking became more moderate and it wasn't that, it was pretty typical for on a, a weekend for three couples to get together and drink 12 to 14 bottles of wine in a night, plus some cognac and uh, uh, it's like, but, you know, that was the norm, that scene norm, although on some levels, I think I knew that, you know, this, this wasn't good. I, I think even I remember some of the guilt in, in high school about drinking and just a dis-ease that it wasn't okay, but it was just such a part of the culture in my 30s. It, I'd love to pause right there and talk about that because I feel like a lot of people could relate to that feeling of um, of guilt, right? Like, and I, I I'm curious because I know you've done a lot of reading on this. Like, it alcohol is a drug that affects your brain, so that guilt that you were feeling, where do you think that came from? Um, part of it, I think it wasn't good for my personal, my spiritual, my being here on the earth. I just kind of felt like it, that it just wasn't okay. Maybe it was part of my upbringing or almost uh, an innate knowing that you were in a sense, poisoning your body. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Even, yeah, I didn't even, hadn't done the exploration that I have now of just how poisonous alcohol is to your body. But yeah, maybe it was more of an innate knowing. So, you know, I felt this guilt and shame. And, and during those times of the 30s, like, I, I knew it wasn't okay, but the what I've learned is the more you do it and the more ingrained it becomes into your mind, the harder it is to control it and that you, you know, wear these tracks into your psyche and, you know, you just, you just keep on doing it despite the shame and the guilt. And that's, and plus it was part of the, the, the culture and my circle of friends and um, yeah, I just, kept on doing it um, till then. And, and then probably, let's see, I have some notes. So when was it in my, uh, I guess, it, yeah. So then the late thirties and then by my forties and fifties, I became a heavy everyday drinker. And, and then, but I, I knew I needed to quit, but I knew I couldn't control it till somewhere Along those lines, I, I did finally go to my doctor and confess to her that how much I was drinking and that I had a problem. And she said to me, honey, we got to get you off the sauce. And that hit a chord with me. And I went home and I remember laying on the couch and just taking that in. And from that day forward, I you know, I don't really remember how I did it, but I did just made up my mind. I, I'm not going to drink anymore. 
Uh, no, this is not cool. And for seven years, I didn't drink anymore. Um, uh, and I remember during that time, you know, I remember I kind of got into being healthier. I was doing hot yoga and I got out of that, um, that, that phase of where you're just, you know, drinking all the time and on the weekends, I remember coming out on a Friday night from hot yoga class and it was like six or seven o'clock in the summer and the, it was beautiful out and just thinking to myself, boy, how happy I am that I don't have to go drink or um, I'm not drinking and I'm just living my life and feeling good. I, I remember that one night. So it went from being something that was fun in your 20s and 30s mm -hmm. a little bit more affluent because of social circles still fun you yes. still felt the fun even though you were um it, it's a, a if I heard you correctly there was always a little bit of an underlying feeling of of guilt um and then so when was it that this extended break happened like how long had you been drinking at that point? Probably pretty heavily from my mid thirties. So for probably about 15 years from my mid thirties to my early fifties. And, and during that time I had started experiencing blackouts, which mm -hmm. I now know is the, the mind's way of, you know, you just, you don't develop memories. Your brain just shuts down and as I think back during those times, you know, there was so much alcohol I was consuming. I don't have a clear picture of what my life was really like because my life just got blurry during those times. So yes, it was fun, but it really, um, really does affect you. And I think that's part of why, I mean, I've had several blackouts over the year and that's that's more than just, you know, where you just pass out of blackouts where you just you can't remember what you did the next day or how I've much had drink. my share <laughs> of blackouts and um I've definitely had people around me have those blackouts um heck I think in our years of partying together you know we've probably shared a couple blackouts um and mm -hmm. I I find it interesting this kind of ties it together that was always for me when my guilt and shame was the heaviest because I couldn't remember what happened. It was like, oh yes. my gosh, what did I do? What did I say? Yes. Oh, did I hurt anyone's feelings? Did I uh -huh. say something I shouldn't have? You know, did I fall down? <laughs> that's yes, that's I think pretty common. And you know, waking up at the 3 a.m. mark, just consumed with anxiety and guilt. And what is it about 3 a.m.? Like, have, have you learned anything about that in your, because yeah. I found that it's chemical. Very, okay. Yeah. It's, it's chemical when all those, the, you know, the neurobiology, the way the chemicals are, are, you know, release produced and then it's about you know 3 a.m where everything kind of comes to the head and boom you're awake consumed with guilt and shame and, and feeling things. bad you can't sleep you you can't be awake I it's, always find it's myself so dying horrible. for water at it's, that point yeah and it's weird that it, I I I thought 3 a.m was my thing I, I nope. didn't realize that that was uh, you'll find in your research it happens to um all of us who consume alcohol in heavy amounts or yeah a lot of us it's not it's it's very typical that 3 a.m anxiety shame guilt I'm never going to drink again <laughs> I'm not going to do this tomorrow you did know. you ever get sick when you were drinking oh yes um yeah. yes uh-huh um not so much when I was drinking, but I do remember one time having heavily drank the night before um, and being with my father. So this was probably when I was in my, I guess I was probably in my 50s and having and going to um, drop off my 
kids at the exes with my dad in the car and having to open the door and throw up because I was so sick and hung over from alcohol poisoning from the night before. So not so much did I throw up in the throes of my alcohol consumptions, but hangovers, yeah. Maybe early on when you drank too much uh, Boone's Farm or whatever. <laughs> Strawberry vines. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes. Uh -huh. I can, yeah, I can definitely recall a few times in my early 20s. <laughs> where you're drinking uh, yeah. Stuff like Mad Dog. Like that stuff is just. Oh, yeah. Ugh. And, and we called it worshiping the, the porcelain, porcelain God. <laughs> yes, worship the porcelain toilet. Yep, and just porcelain king. Please make it stop. I swear uh -huh. I'll never drink oh, again. Yeah. Like bargaining oh. with some, like, yeah, it's enters. Uh, okay, so you don't drink. You get off I the don't sauce drink. for seven yeah. years. For seven years. I love the number yeah. seven, so I, I, I. Oh, yes. I uh -huh. think that's, yeah. Uh -huh. that's yeah. Magical, that's pretty special. But, um, so you started again. Yeah. So then what happened? The mind is a funny business. One time I got the idea that it was my birthday and I had a friend in town, an old high school friend in town getting together with family. And I thought, you know what? I could just have a glass of wine with my birthday dinner. I can have a glass of wine. Well, and once I had that glass of wine, it started again. It, it, and I liken it to when I was a cigarette smoker. I was a born again chain smoker and I stopped. And then one time I thought with my friend, you know, we're getting together, having a drink. I could just have a cigarette with him. Well, on the way home, I stopped and bought a pack of cigarettes and smoked the whole thing before I even got home. So it's all like I'm either nothing. all in or all out. I know before you <laughs> quit drinking, um, we had we had gone out one night and we both drank quite a bit. And I remember both of us touching base over. It was like a Friday night. And the next morning, we were both like, oh, just laying there on the couch, uh, didn't want to move, didn't want to do anything. I think mm -hmm. both of us had mascara under our <laughs> eyes, you know. Oh, how embarrassing. Yeah. We looking like we got the flu. <laughs> and I, you know, I can remember us talking about it then. And I don't even think it was on the horizon for either of us to consider, like, this wasn't a normal thing. <laughs> thing yeah like, no I'm gonna go out with the girls and have a few drinks and, and over drink and, and then get home happen. and be like well do you want to open a bottle of wine oh well we should have a Manhattan I mean I remember this night very specifically with you and it uh -huh. was we had a ton of fun um and I think that's the 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 kind of yeah. wicked part of this right it's like it actually yes. is fun I personally really like drinking I don't really like getting drunk anymore but I like the taste of alcohol. Yeah. Um, and so it, but anyhow, I remember us uh, talking after that over the next couple of days about like how it just felt like it was a whole weekend lost. And that's what it is. Covering. Yeah. It, it, you, you drink so much. It is a whole weekend lost. And before you know it, it's a whole lifetime lost. It yeah. steals your life. Mm all that mm. you know or at least my life for you know 15 20 years where Did you know it, i just can't remember okay so let's i i want to follow that up with when you realize that i think first it's worth exploring when did you stop drinking um i know you shared that somebody very close to you was struggling with alcohol and decided to stop. And so you kind of did it like as a buddy thing, like, oh, well, yeah. I'll, I'm going to not drink, you know, for 30 days, I think you said uh -huh. at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so and I'd, I'd already known that, all right, this, it, you know, during the pandemic, I began heavy daily drinking because you're at home alone. I'd also end a, ended a relationship. Again, I had chosen 
a relationship that wasn't really nurturing to my self growth. And so I'd ended that relationship. And but did they was, drink? I would day drink. Yeah. yeah. I finally got to the point where, you know, you were thinking, well, you know, it's two o'clock. If I can start at two o'clock, then maybe I can, you know, be done by six o'clock and then I can go to bed and I can wake up and recover and then I can get up. And so, yeah, I, you know, the, when I would, could allow myself to start drinking would be earlier and earlier and the shame and the guilt continued and promising not to drink the next day. And why do I drink and not being able to control it? So I, I knew I wasn't happy with my relationship with alcohol, but I was just incapable of controlling it. Until one night when I was uh, heavily drinking with someone that I truly love and they begged me not to drink anymore and open a, another bottle of wine, I, I just couldn't resist and I did it. And I woke up at three o'clock in that morning with such an extreme feeling of sh shame and guilt. And not only had I let myself down, I'd let someone down that I loved so deeply. And I just said, I, I can't do this anymore. I never want to feel this way again. And I knew about the Annie Grace and the 30 day alcohol experiment. And I decided to take it on the next, then it was that, that was the last drink that I had. That was probably six months ago. And it's not always been easy, but when I think back, when I want to drink, I think back to that, the way I felt that morning at three in the morning and realize I don't ever want to feel that way again. That's kind of what's, has been able to stop me from that point I had point to hold forward. back tears a little bit as you were sharing that. Um, that's really powerful. And because I think it's important for people to hear that they're not alone. This is, this, yeah. this is, it takes effort um, and comes with some hardships. But first, let's talk about the joy because uh, from the outside, I will tell you, not only do you look more joyful. Um, you look healthy. Your skin is glowing. Um, you've lost a lot of weight. I, I mean, you look fabulous. You look 20 years younger. And so I know there's definitely been some physical gains in there. Um, and you've always been what I would consider a spiritual person. Um, I mean, you've had a meditation room at every house that I've visited. Um, yoga, Buddhism. Um, and so how you, yeah, you share. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, so since quitting drinking, I've rediscovered what a wonderful world and life it can be. There's so many wonders to behold and explore. Whereas when you're in the throes of alcohol, you know, you just dampen all of your feelings and learn that it's okay to feel. So I'm just enjoying so much. See, when what I decided or figured out about myself is that I used the alcohol to self-medicate. So I didn't have to think about or address or face um, the hard issues in my life and take action. I was afraid to face my true self and make changes in my life that were constructive, that for, I was looking for my self-worth in others and that led to depression because, you know, instead of internally accepting myself, I was looking for self-worth in others. And, you know, I made poor choices in, um, partnerships and that didn't really nurture my personal growth and my spiritual growth. So a lot of it, you know, I just dampened so I didn't have to feel. Um, 
Yeah, so and how about now? Well, now I'm learning to be okay with myself and exploring who I am and learning to accept who I am with all my flaws because none of us are perfect and that's okay. And it's okay to feel feelings. Sometimes we are bored or we're scared or um, feelings are okay. You feel them, you release them, you move on. You don't let them get stuck and you don't need alcohol to mask them, to self-medicate. Um, that's, uh, yeah. So what about physically? Um, I think some of the things that you've shared is not, now that you're not drinking, right? You wake up fresh, you've been going to, you do, I know you do like aqua fit, uh-huh. Um, like I've shared, you look great physically. Um, and I think that it also uh, seems to have enabled a lot healthier diet choices. Yes. And that was kind of the, the cognitive uh, disassociation. Like before, like in my 50s, when I drank a lot, I and even in my mid 30s, I would I would not eat so I wouldn't have calories so I could, you know, be thin and be the trophy wife and fit into society's uh, expectations of me. So yeah, I would withhold food so in so that I could have alcohol. And so now I just I eat better. I nourish my body, I nourish my mind. I'm not perfect. I, you know, there's I'm striving for self-improvement but you know it's a journey and yeah now I don't have that cognitive disconnect of alcohol in there where somehow it just like you're doing all these things you're doing yoga you're trying to eat right but you're drinking this you know putting poison into your body every day mass amounts of it yeah I've, uh, so, I've laughed with a, a couple friends, um, some that are going to join me here on the podcast about, um, I keep seeing signs for yoga and wine and I'm like, those totally two like, thoughts seem to go together. Uh -uh. I mean, I've been practicing yoga for over 20 years and I'm like, I, that the idea is nauseating to me and that's not even like with any <laughs> judgments about alcohol itself until, you know. It's just so should we get into that uh, um, advertising culture that we have here where I, they just yeah. normalize alcohol use from everything? I saw a commercial on television. Was it television where it's like, oh, it's OK, mommy, you need to have a drink while you're at your kid's soccer practice just to make it palatable. Like, what is up with that? Or, you know, you have to have wine at every celebration, every wedding, every funeral, every, you know, life event. It's and all over on TV. I don't watch a lot of TV. Uh, there's two shows, and I'm not going to call them out specifically, that I've been watching. Um, and, you know, they've got seven, ten seasons of episodes. And I realize, you know... I would say this probably started like at, towards the beginning of the year, right? Is when I really started thinking in, about this and getting curious about this. And I noticed every episode, like they're having a drink, they're pouring yep. a drink. Let's have a drink. Yeah. We need a drink, right? And, and yet they keep drinking and they never get drunk. And you, it's like they can drink all this mass quantities, but they never get drunk or never affects them. Yep. Yeah. It, well, and it's, it reminds me of like, you know, back in the day that was cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I, uh -huh. I mean, you don't ever see people smoking on TV anymore. No, that's a good thing. What, and I think, you know, I've heard that the, whatever the, this gen, newest generation is, is that they are drinking less, that alcohol is not the cultural norm, which I think is great. And maybe we can get to that where, you know, al corporations, the alcohol industry can, you know, have so much money for advertising to make it okay to drink. 
even though since 1988, we've known that it was classified as a carcinogen, it causes cancer. Tell, talk more about that. That was very specific. Yeah, um, I think I learned that from, I'm not sure in my research where I learned about that, but in 1988, they did classify alcohol as a carcinogen. I can't cite my source on that, so I can't really say it's vetted, but on uh, some podcast or something I read or listened to, you can find out that alcohol in any amount is a poison in your body. And any amount of alcohol turns into something that's poisonous in your body with the release of dopamine and serotonin um, to process it. The, the um, side effect is a toxin to your body. That's one of the reasons I, I, I am aware of that. And um, I will do some research around the, the 1988 fact. Uh -huh. I, I find yeah. that fascinating any amount of alcohol does cause that effect. So part of what I've committed to for um, this hundred day thing is not even drinking non-alcoholic beers. Cause I I've noticed they have 0.05% alcohol uh -huh. by volume. And I'm like, no, I want no, none, zero. Right. So yeah. even some, like there's a lot of kombuchas, right. That are yeah. fermented. Uh -huh. uh, you see less of those. No, yes, but I, I remember when kombucha really got popular a few years ago, they all had some form of alcohol in them. Um, and so I'm curious because while I'm aware of it, I don't have a lot of information. You said that there's a there's a, a dopamine serotonin. So basically, it's a, a chemical reaction, regardless of the amount. So it doesn't yes. matter. OK, exactly. Yeah. So that first initial drink you take, the dopamine, which is the feel good response, gets released. But your brain wants to stay in equilibrium. So then it has to give you things to kind of try to get you back in equilibrium. So you set off this chemical reaction and then you're always chasing that high of you know how good it felt now what i've learned there's still this debate on is alcohol you know is there a, a gene that makes you predisposed or um is it genetic or trauma-based and maybe it's a little bit of both there there are people who can have a drink and then there are those that just get really sleepy and then there are those of us who have a drink and they get energized well, those that get sleepier may be called the normal drinkers, and the others are those of us that can become alcoholics with con with continued use, maybe not at the first drink, but continued use, our brains do what it what the what it's supposed to do. It those of us who get energized from drinking, they they're chasing that high and they want to drink, and you set off this uh chain reaction in your mind. Do you think your you're an alcoholic? Well, I don't know what to think about that term. I did. And I've heard it described as an alcohol use disorder. Yeah, I guess I did have an alcohol use disorder, but an alcoholic oh, and then functional alcoholic. Yes, I was yeah. a functional alcoholic. Even despite my heavy drinking, I was able to have a job for the most part. I did have to call in sick a few times during my uh drinking years because I was too hung over to go to work but mm. um functioning alcoholic yes I always thought that an alcoholic was somebody who couldn't stop or when they did stop had a really hard time and I think that that was one of the reasons why throughout my life I've gone I've had breaks right yeah. it, almost to prove to myself and, I'm not an alcoholic right. I can stop I can take yeah. it or leave it no big deal um, and I, I think that that was a, a very constrained idea of alcoholism, right? Slippery slope there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just because I could not drink for a year doesn't necessarily mean I wasn't using alcohol as much as it was also a fun thing. Um, right. Like Abusing you. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Using it as a, a form of escape. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a form of escape. I think of it as like 
sometimes, uh, you know, an escape from, I don't want to do anything. So I'll just zone out because then I don't have to face things or, you know. What about personality when you're drinking? Oh, I think I, well, I think, you know, I get kind of sappy and happy. I don't get mean, but it does, you get stupid. And now when you're, I know when you're not drinking, you just see how stupid people get. Even if they're happy, (laughs) even if it's happy, stupid, it's just like, it's not. Everybody starts talking louder and they're all saying the same thing, but thinking they're arguing Uh and yeah. Um, So one of the things that we are big on at Little Big is the Wheel of Life. Um, And right now, the current model of the Wheel of Life is focused around seven uh, key areas. And so I would love to like just kind of almost quick fire um, how not drinking has affected these areas. Mm -hmm. So work, you already said, I think kind of like you used to call in sick because you were hungover. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Now I find more, well, and maybe a part of the age that I'm at and I'm, you know, semi-retired, but, you know, I find work more pleasurable. Yeah. Yeah. What about money? Money. There's an app that shows you just how much you save when you don't drink mass amounts of uh, alcohol. So Mm -hmm. I've probably saved a lot of money. There's a, do you, do you have that app or do you know the name of it? Um, well, it's, I think it's on the alcohol anonymous app or, um, you know, one of the quick drinking apps. It we will say, you know, I, if I, if I think back about when I was at my heavy drinking, I mean, if you're drinking a bottle or two of wine a day, which I have, um, we'll say that's $20 a day times seven days a week times a month times a year. Uh, it adds up quick. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, next spoke of the wheel, love life. Love life. Uh, I'm learning to love myself. I love uh, that. That's yeah. yeah. That's my love life. Yeah, um, I know we've talked about this and I'll probably get into it in another episode, but I do believe that um, the best love story is realizing that you are the one or I am the one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, family. Yep. How has it affected family? Um, family, I think, you know, that they're, um, they're proud of me. They're happy for me. Um, I can be m- more genuine with family instead of that background shame or guilt about what I'm doing that I don't agree with in that yeah. consumption of alcohol. Uh, spirituality. Oh, growing, uh, you know, uh, much more exploration into my um, relationship with the universe and a creator and the wonder of life and the universe and yeah it's such a wondrous world what about um friends um and i'm gonna pause the quick fire just a little bit because i think that especially when it comes to drinking versus non-drinking this is where a lot of people get stuck um is it is a very social thing um so how has not drinking changed friends for you? So far, it really hasn't. Um, at When I first got together with friends who I used to drink with, and, you know, it was always a, a reason to get together. Let's get together and drink and, you know, get feeling good and get drunk. And how am I going to handle that? But you know what? It was okay. Um It's okay because in my mind, I just decided I don't, I don't want to be this person. And I've gotten a lot of help off of podcasts, things that, you know, that you can do or say, um, and incorporate to your being about, you know, I know a lot of people have a hard time 
watch, you know, being where other people are drinking. Sometimes, yeah, I might go, oh, I wish I could have a drink and get that buzz. But then my mind can go back to, yeah, that buzz that lasts 20 minutes and then you're ridden with guilt and shame and nah, I don't think so. Uh-huh. <laughs> What, what do you, okay. So when you are out, what do you drink? Um, I have found that there actually are beers that are 0.00% alcohol. I don't know how they say they um, take all the alcohol out, but there is an IPA out there that doesn't have any alcohol. So I can have one of those and just drink it. That kind of tastes like alcohol. So maybe you're feeling like, yeah, it's okay. And then when I get together with family who's drinking, well, oh, I did find a um, a beverage with one of my family members that we used to drink like Manhattans with. It's something that just has, it's not got sugar in it, but it's got some kind of pepper. So it has that kind of a hot effect. And so you can and you can have one of those and kind of feel like, okay, I'm having my Manhattan with you. Almost like a, an alcohol-free spirit or uh, an alcohol-free spirit. Yeah. Okay. Cause I, I love Mia Manhattan. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's like one of my favorites. And I do recall now you sharing that with me. Um, yeah, I have to turn you on to what that is. I, yeah, I, I find don't know if they have uh, it there. Uh, they do. And, and what I find too, is I like, a, I like different kinds of mocktails. Right. Um, and, and for a few reasons, one, there is a lot of social pressure around drinking and yes. it can be um, a big deal. Right. So mm -hmm. I know at one point in my twenties, I didn't drink for a year and it would like bother people. And yes, so like, I does, had a yeah. friend who would like try to sneak alcohol in my drink. And I'm like, why? Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but I always yeah. had um, like my own cocktail so that it looked like I was drinking. Yes. I mean, I've even gone so far as to take shots of water with people because uh -huh. you know, they're so drunk. Oh, yeah. They don't oh, even yeah. realize. Don't. That's right. Or you can just have a tonic with lime. Yeah. And then... Mm -hmm. People think you're having a drink, you know, because it is so hard. You know why? Because I think it kind of part of why is it kind of throws in their face that maybe they have a relationship with alcohol that they don't want to explore. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I I think you're right. Well, and it's, oh, did you get in trouble or are you pregnant if you're a female? Uh -huh. Like there's always like, what's the reason like what you, you just want to be a better person and feel good about yourself well, well does that mean I'm not a good person right like yes, there's, right it's very it is yeah. a very 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 charged I want to say part of choosing to not drink because yeah. of the social aspect of it so yeah no it's an it, I I would say that's probably the number one challenge that I've heard shared um yes it yeah I yeah, think you're I, right there yeah a couple of friends of mine um their challenge is that they needed the sugar so they found themselves hoarding candy and so that was their challenge uh -huh. like they didn't care yeah. about being around people drinking which I found uh -huh. ironic right like uh -huh. that's what's hard is you you want sugar right and I got well, yeah alcohol, alcohol is, is a sugar yeah you know? so uh-huh <laughs> So the last spoke of the wheel of life is self. And I feel like you've answered this in totality through our conversation, but quick fire, how has not drinking changed your relationship with yourself? Just self-exploration and accepting who I am and being okay with me and my flaws and that I'm loved and I've always been loved and yeah, just a greater acceptance. That's awesome. Any other resources that have helped you? Um, I, I I know you mentioned Annie Grace and that podcast. I'll look that up. I don't know if there's any books that you've read that you want to share. Yeah, I wish. Let's see. Um, Annie Grace's Naked Mind is a book. Um, there's another 
uh, podcast that I listen to. It's re called Recovery Elevator, and I like that one a lot. And both of those have a weekly podcast. They've been around for a while because I think they're up into like 400 number of podcasts. And so they're just, you know, uh, reconfirming or self-assuring that that you're okay and if you hear other people's stories and you have this aha it's like gosh you know I am okay there you know I am okay oh the biology of desire is another book that I read from the library and it delves more into um the science hmm. of alcohol and its effect on the brain so and another book is called We Are the Luckiest. Okay. We Are the Luckiest. We Are the Luckiest. Yeah. I know for sure. I plan to check those out. I will link it so that our listeners can yeah. also have access to those resources. I, in one of the podcasts, I um, was, you know, they task you with journaling and to think about certain things. So I wrote a letter to alcohol. Oh, I'd like to read it. Yes, I please. called it, I called it teacher. Dear teacher, I met you when I was a teenager. You told me if I was your friend, others would like me and I would fit in. I knew you were lying, but the promise was so alluring that I followed you. I didn't have the wisdom I have today to know better. I wanted acceptance from my peers and to be liked for being me. You taught me nothing about being me. In fact, you didn't let me be me. You taught me how to hide from being me. You stole so much of my life from me over the years. At the time, I wasn't aware of this, but over time, the true lesson emerged, and I'm grateful for that. You're a sneaky little shit. In the beginning, you promised the world, and I bought into the glamour, excitement, festivity, and camaraderie. You blinded me to the real joy and excitement of my life. I learned to associate with others who have been duped by societal norms in the U.S. that alcohol was necessary to have fun, celebrate, and lead a fulfilling life. I now realize you numb my life experiences. What started as enjoyment led to dulled, fuzzy memories. You stole my happiness. My letter to alcohol. That is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for allowing the platform. I'm glad I hope I can, if my story can help others, then, then we did it. That's right. That's right. Um, I, I think that's a beautiful note to end on. So again, thank you. And I look forward to talking with you again. Okay. Um, if you're open to it, I would love to invite you back to. Um, oh, I'd love it. Awesome. Yeah. I look yeah. forward to it. And I know I'll talk to you before then. Uh, okay. I have so much love for you always. And incredibly proud of the, the way you have embraced this journey. And thank you for inspiring me. Thank you. Much talk love. You. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to sharing more with you as we continue to explore being undrunken together with friends. I hope the Undrunken podcast is helpful and inspiring to all of you out there. So if you liked this episode, please send it to a friend and help share these stories with more people.